Hi, my name is Brock Brights, and I run the internet. Not the whole internet, that'd be silly. I just run a small part in Southern Nevada and Las Vegas. And I'm here to show you why your home router isn't the greatest. In fact, it just sucks. In this video, we'll go over all the different components of your router, what a router is, and why when your internet provider tells you to reboot it, you should probably do it. This is your typical home router and it sucks. This thing costs between $50 to $500, controls all your internet needs, does all your streaming, all your TV goes through it, and it's really bad at what it does compared to what we use in the internet world. This thing contains three devices in one, at least. One is the Wi-Fi, two is the actual routing port, and the other part is the switch right here. When you look at all these things and combine them into one cheap device, it's going to suck compared to the stuff the internet uses, and I'm going to tell you why. So here you have your home router. When you open it up, you have your little components in here. Inside of your little components, you only have a few pieces. It doesn't matter which ones you get, if you get them between $500 or even higher, they are all pretty much the same. They just look a lot different on the outside, but there's not much to it. You have your heat sink that controls, uh, make sure your Wi-Fi chipsets don't get too hot. And then you have your Wi-Fi chips. This one is 5 gigahertz. This is your 2.4 gigahertz. It's about double the size because it's about double the wavelength. Over here is your flash memory. These are your LAN controllers. And over here is your actual uh, processor that's controlling everything. On top of here, you can see that you really only have one little thing for power conditioning. This is a little capacitor right here. So if you get a power surge, if it's a little bit more power than this capacitor can handle, you'll find these things will lock up or weird things will happen. When you look at something that's always going to be on for so long, oftentimes you'll find stuff gets corrupted. When you have a power spike, you can get all sorts of bits corrupted. And when you do that, you'll get weird stuff that happens. You'll get that page not loading, random dropouts. And your only real solution to this is you can't reboot parts of it. You really got to unplug the power and plug it back in. That's your only action you can do. Just think about like all the stuff that's actually going to go on it. You're never going to reboot it unless your power goes out, really. You're never going to adjust it. It's all going to just work silently in the recesses of your cabinet. So by having Wi-Fi, you've opened up your network to everything within like a 300 foot radius of where you are. So think about that. The password is very critical because if you let someone on your network, they can oftentimes see into your network, download data, get into your files, and see a lot of stuff onto your network where you just thought you were sharing your Wi-Fi account with one of your buddies. They don't even have to be in your house oftentimes, and they can get onto your network and just start scanning and see what they can see. So if you have that password open and you give it to someone, it's the same as giving them a cable. They have the same capabilities to access data. They have the same capabilities to get onto your network. So when you think about, uh, giving out access. Remember, when you give someone your password, you're giving them access onto your network. Whether it's local or through the Wi-Fi part, it's really the same network segment, so that you gotta be really mindful about. Let's look at the, what the professional version of this looks like. Each part is independent, and they're completely, uh, they don't talk to each other, they, don't, they aren't managed in the same interface, they're all independent devices that you have to log in and set up independently. Here you had to have a switch, and it's a lot more robust and we'll go over the reason why. And then we have your uh, router and that's what allows you to get to the internet and onto my network. And then you have your Wi-Fi APs. So some of the different specifics of this switch are in order to run your phones or your uh, any other device that takes power, these things also have uh, PoE built into them. PoE is a uh, power over ethernet. So this is outputting power. This allows you to run all your office phones on it without power supplies. This allows you to run all these, all these Wi-Fi pieces without any power. On top of that, it also has a separate, they call it a control plane. And then there's also the data plane. The data plane is what actually switches all the traffic. So if you actually have something that breaks on the control plane, oftentimes the data plane still 
runs and you uh, are able to still pass traffic. It's highly, highly redundant in case something actually breaks in, in the software. It also has a lot of hardware components in here. Altogether, this could also be powering all your devices too. So uh, that's why we have such big redundant power supplies. So if one fails, they could actually uh, still work. So that no matter what, you could power your cameras, you could power your uh, security systems, your thumb readers, you could have them power your uh, access points and your phones. This actually can draw up to 715 watts of power. If you look inside here, we see a lot of components versus your little home router, which essentially these two are your switch. But there's a lot of features in your router that also tell me what's going on. So if there is a problem on this, it'll report back to me uh, by some kind of central management system and tell me which subcomponent is having a problem. It's really hard to break a switch. If something's going wrong, it usually still works even if you can't control it. The other thing that's different about a switch is every device that's out there has a thing called a MAC address and these don't actually even know uh, about the internet. They just know about MAC addresses and will just send things from one MAC address to another. If it can't find something on the local MAC address, that's when it pushes it off to the router. So the router is the part that goes to the internet. A router is a general purpose CPU that can be programmed to do anything really. It also has a lot of things that I can use to monitor what's going on with it. I can constantly see its CPU flow, how much uh, data is going through it. It has a lot of components that are highly upgradable. Versus the switch, this looks a lot more like a, com like a regular computer motherboard than a uh, switch which has a lot more defined circuits. You can see here we have the memory that's completely upgradable, hot swap power supplies so that it can uh, just draw as much power as it needs. The monitoring on these things is amazing. It does a thing called a NetFlow where I could see all my users traffic that's not encrypted and make graphs of all the sites it's going to. The, uh, the facilities within the, within the router are really amazing for the amount of uh, things it can do. So here we have your uh, access points. These are the things that allow you to get on the Wi-Fi. Here we have different form factors, but they're still just access points. The, the different form factors allow for different antennas or different workspaces. Like here we have your uh, outdoor access point. I use these in like trailer parks or outside con con convention centers. Or this I'll use on top of a pole that's hard to reach or I don't have it. I don't want as much wind loading as this thing. This one will put up in your office complex. Uh, in your restaurant, anywhere you need Wi-Fi that looks like a smoke detector essentially. But what's different from these from your home network are these are all controlled by a centralized controller. With a centralized controller I can have more than one access point and they'll all work together to allow people on versus if I take a more if I take a few home routers and put them on you're also duplicating the functions of the home router, which is usually the problem that we run into when people have large homes and they buy multiple routers. What does it cost to get a, a network that is great, ultimate, like that everyone would want at their home? It's really cost prohibitive. This, the max you're gonna pay is about 500 bucks. These costs, this thing costs about two to 5,000. This thing costs two to 20,000, depending on the software you need. These aren't too bad at, uh, just because the manufacturer doesn't go so much with the support contracts. There's different vendors out there that will charge an arm and a leg. What should I go buy now that my home router sucks? Realistically, I don't think there's a lot of options for you. So what should you get? You really should just buy cheap, buy often, buy whatever the latest is because they're made for planned obsolescence. Over time, those capacitors and the memory spaces are going to get corrupted. They're going to have problems and you're going to have to replace it because it's not like they have individual components you could replace one by one. So I'd say just be prepared to go buy the newest technology or whatever it is of the day. From the ISP perspective, we have equipment on your premises that give us a lot of diagnostic data and tell us what's going on. So we can see how much traffic's going to you, we can see your signal levels, we can see your modulation rates. Oftentimes we're going to ask you to reboot your home router and oftentimes that fixes it. So when in doubt, please restart your router and, and don't fight tech support saying you already did.